the tip of the teeth, the tip, the tits, the tongue. No, that's not right. <laughs> the tip, the tip of the teeth, the lips, the tongue. I love that you said the tip of the teeth, the tits, the tongue. Yes, as everyone just heard. Uh, all right. Well, how are you doing, Lex? Oh, I'm good. How are you? Uh, yeah, you know, great. Good. Good. Uh, we're all the dog in in the room that's on fire all the time. So, what? like that question always feels kind of oh, redundant to me. Like the meme or the, the meme. This is fine, dog. Yeah, the oh, meme. Yeah. The the fire dog. Yeah, I, I know what you're putting down. Yeah, exactly. Did you play anything good this week? Um, I okay. I finally bit the bullet and did and and got the expansion pack or membership or whatever to the N64. Sure, the Nintendo Switch on Online Switch. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So that has really opened up my world quite a yeah. bit. So I <laughs> so I have all of these awesome games and all week all I've been playing is Dr. Mario. Just Oh, nice. On like I fucking hate Dr. Mario. It makes me stressed I, out. Yeah, it's so stressed out. It's not helping my stress levels of mm-hmm. my stressful week no, as I was be telling that. you before that. Yeah. But this is all I'm like, I just gotta, I just gotta beat it. Your stressful real job week <laughs> that you're not allowed to talk about. So the, the details are oh so salacious and, and, and wild that if we, we talked about them, you'd lose your job. I would. But we'd have I so would. many more followers for our podcast. We would have so many followers. It, it should have just been like bullshit, crazy drama stories with Lexi. And I would be like, guess what happened? And then I would tell you all these things. And then Lexi spills the tea. Spilling on the tea. The teaching. But instead, I play Dr. Mario and snap at John when he's trying to be very kind to me and ask me about my day. I'm like, mine. I'm just playing this Mario level. Ah. You're fucking up my game. <laughs> if I lose now, just... John, it's your fault. <laughs> Wario beat me again. It's your fault, John. <laughs> no. It's your fault. Speaking of Wario, I bought a Waluigi and a Wario hat. I saw. They are so cute. That I will never no. wear. No, no. Um, because what kind of self-respecting you know, age that I am person would wear that outside the house. At what age does wearing video game attire become inappropriate? It depends. Like, I feel like, and it also depends on who you are and what you do. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a stay-at-home parent slash cartoonist slash podcaster. Yes. I feel like I can get away with a lot. Yeah, yeah. Like, I still, um, like, I currently have my most recent hat purchase is a Bart Simpson skateboarding (laughs) hat. (laughs) Of course it is. And I wear it out constantly, but for some reason... The giant uh, W on a yellow hat or the giant upside down L on a purple hat are the line that I draw. <laughs> That's a step I think it's just too far. <laughs> I like the way they exist. Like, I like that they exist, but they're just like, you know. Yeah. They're for decor. I just want, you know, to support my boys. I remember when I was like 21, 22 or something. I don't. <laughs> oh. oh. Uh, but there was this guy that I worked with and he was trying to impress me, I think. And he was talking about how he had this really sweet kind of silk shirt with Vegeta on it. And he was yep. like, it's buttoned up and it's really nice. And I wore it to a wedding. And I just remember thinking like, oh, no, nobody at that wedding was happy, happy no. there, Vegeta boy. And I just thought like, did he say, unless it was an anime wedding? No, it wasn't. It was like a straight lace. Like no, people from I mean, like rural Alberta were like, the f- is this? Yeah. They didn't even know who Vegeta was. No. Like, why is that man wearing a cartoon? Button up silk shirt. There is a type of social credit that goes along with wearing a button up shirt of that variety. Ooh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the instinct is to go to Guy Fieri and, and start making fun of that. I yeah, was just okay, thinking everyone does. That. You talk about that kind of shirt and it goes Guy Fieri. <laughs> I know. But there was a time in the early 2000s where everyone was wearing those. They were a thing. Like, uh, I mean, early 2000s. I'm talking like 2002. It was like Hot Topic had them all. No. Yeah. Yeah, they did. But like, how many people do you know that really, truly wore them? Like every single boy in high school. No. No, No. you don't think so? No. Mm. Google 2002 boy. And I bet you the person that you see in that picture is going to be wearing Right now, 2002 boy fashion. Am I going to see gross things? I just really, you can never see anything good on the internet anymore. No, I don't see any button-up silk shirts. I see the kid from Malcolm in the Middle who played Dewey. I don't know why. What the hell is wrong with Bing? But I've just gotten so much stuff about <laughs> about a boy by typing in 2002 boy. Bing, why do you suck so much? Let's go to Google. <laughs> 
can I just not? I, I'm going to use Jess's phrase here of like not to yuck your yum. That's my phrase. But the type of person, okay, whatever. It's the phrase that we will use for this show. It is. It's the. All right, do boy fashion early two thousands, no. and you will find this okay. shirt. Boy. Thank you for tuning into this episode, by the way. Uh, boy <laughs> we Google fashion. shitty shirts that remind <laughs> us of Guy Fieri. To, to prove a point. I'm still looking at the same thing. I'm using Google. Yeah, me too now. And you're using Bing. Uh, no, I'm not using Bing. I moved to Google. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of like hot pants yeah. on the women. I don't know why it's bringing this Slightly up. Slightly three-quarter hats. Yes. Puffy. Lots of like Avril Lavigne type things. Lots of fur collars. Baggy Jinko jeans and large chains. Uh-uh. I have to share lots of hoods. What might be the coolest photo I've ever seen in my life with you. The type of person who would wear a button-up anime shirt to a wedding is probably the same type of person today that might wear like a fake animal tail to a wedding. Mm, I kind of think, think so? so. I don't know. Well, to a wedding, yeah. sure. Yeah. I feel like when you add the caveat of to a wedding, it changes the type of person. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people, especially Gen Z now, that wear like tails and animal hats and furry paws and stuff like that and there was a group of people that did that in our time as well oh my god yeah look at this picture that is that is if 90s late late 90s early 2000s could be in a picture it would be this the big pants the the chain Mm -hmm. did you ever have a wallet chain no i uh i never was my vibe oh i had a wallet chain um i had a yellow plaid wallet and and a big long chain that hooked onto my belt loop. And then I wore the giant, giant belt buckles that were like novelty, but they were always kind of like Power Rangery. So there was yeah. like a pink lightning bolt or something. Yeah, no, I had a phase that was with the the belts in the early 2000s. <laughs> Everybody had a collection of like 30 belt buckles. Yeah. I had one that was like the Hello My Name Is name tag and like another mm-hmm. one that was like poker cards and some guns oh, and stuff because yeah. it was it coincided with the uh, the whole Texas Hold'em thing that happened in yes. the early 2000s. Oh, God. Oh, I had one that was a rainbow um, seat belt with cool. the seat belt click instead of yeah. like the belt buckle things. So. I, I actually remember you yeah. wearing that in college. Yes, I did. Cool. I wore my no big deal. belt buckle collection in college as well. We were all very cool. Yeah. Very yeah. cool people. Um, you know what? And as cool people, let's let's start talking about our actual show here. <laughs> let's hit the theme song. Almost played it again. Welcome back. This is Ooh. Dork Matters. Uh, I'm your dad, Dork host, Ben Rankle, and with me is your Ed Dork Cater, Lexi Hunt. And we are here to talk about the Calvin and the Hobbs. Oh, I'm so excited. Now, who are Calvin and Hobbs? You are maybe asking. No. Uh, no, are you're you not really asking, asking that. that? Nobody's no, asking that. You know who no. Calvin and Hobbs is. Yeah. Ibs is. Is is I imagine there's a group of people or possibly Gen yeah. Z that doesn't really vibe with the Calvin and Hobbes. Um, Do you think so? Do you think that this generation is just like, what? Because there is an element of like, there's so much outside play. Okay, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Maybe we should do a little bit of a background on what Calvin and Hobbes is. Let's do it. Let's start off strong. Let's give people information that they can actually use. Okay. Well, thanks to Wikipedia, we've got some great information about Calvin and Hobbes here. So uh, it all started back in November of 1985 when a daily American comic strip called Calvin and Hobbes, created by cartoonist Bill Watterson, hit the syndicated newspapers. And it was basically like, what, a four-panel comic strip that depicted a six-year-old a strip. boy. Yeah. yeah, a strip. Kids don't know um, what comic strips are no. anymore, but that's what it was. They don't know what newspapers are. They We're just know. heading down a rabbit hole oh of things God. we have to explain. Syndication? Well, that was when a big publisher would pick up your your, your comic and, and try to sell it to newspapers across the, the yeah. world or the country. For like a weekly spot. Newspapers, you say? They were these periodicals <laughs> that would come out daily. Uh, to your house. To your home often or in boxes along mm-hmm. the street and you would put in a quarter for a paper 
I remember going to like the newspaper boxes and my dad would give me yeah. a quarter or whatever it wound up being so that I could go get him a paper so he could read it. And he always got two. He got the Calgary Herald and the Calgary Sun and then he complained no. about both of them. Yeah, I mean, those were the only papers we had. Yeah. But some people used to get, okay, this is super dorky, but like some people, our neighbors would get the New York Times. Oh no, no, stop. We can't be dorky on our show that's named for being a dork. Not dorky. <laughs> But some people would like l- go above and beyond and they would buy like yeah, the yeah. Washington Post or the New York Times. You can get a subscription. Yeah. Yeah. For the cross. Yeah. For, for just a <laughs> whole other level of journalistic writing anyway. So mm-hmm. that's what yeah. a newspaper is. Are you is. trying to say that the level of journalistic writing we are uh, getting here in Calgary circa our <laughs> 650,000 people at the time? Yeah was not on the same par as the New York Times? Shockingly, along with the Sunshine Girl, who was a scantily clad 20-year-old girl randomly in the pages of the paper. It was somebody's job to go find this person and take pictures of them. And then they they would write about, like, this is Meredith, and she likes apples. They're like, what the fuck is this? And very rarely there was a Sunshine Boy. I don't remember there ever being a Sunshine Boy. There definitely was. I think it was only once a week on... Or something. I don't remember how often it happened. But oh yeah, there was a sunshine boy. Google that shit. But the Calgary Herald carried uh, Calvin and Hobbes, and that was my favorite. And I still remember the day that my dad was like, hey, bud, Calvin and Hobbes is ending. And I was like, no. Yeah. What? Yeah. What were we, like grade four and five at the time? Yeah, it would have been like grade five or grade six. It was 95. Yeah, it ends 95. in 95. It has a 10-year run. Yeah. Do you think we adequately described what Calvin and Hobbes was, or did I derail us to try to explain syndication and, uh, and newspapers? Well, I think we, we went off a little bit on what, what a syndication is. <laughs> um, Gen Z might know comics. Uh, a, a comic strip yes. is more like a web comic for the younger gen. Or uh, sometimes yeah. when you're on Instagram, uh, you'll see a mm-hmm. sequence of images posted, like four that kind of tell a story if you swipe through them. And this was all in one place. Same idea, except you couldn't yeah. swipe in the paper. And I mean, you could. You just rubbed off a bunch of newsprint and got all your fingers oh dirty. <laughs> it was such a dad thing to say. <laughs> Stupid. Oh, God. <laughs> the face I'm getting from Lexi. <laughs> You're the dad of dork. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you forget what I do, who I am? Oh, my God. Uh, another fun thing you can do with a paper is get some silly putty and uh, press it to the comics, and then you pull the silly putty. Do you know what silly putty is? Do I have to explain silly putty now? This is just going to be a whole rabbit hole. <laughs> silly putty was sort of oh a malleable, um, what would you describe it it's as? It's putty. Uh, it's like liquid. Play-Doh. <laughs> it's putty. They don't know what putty is. It's like Play-Doh, but it was more solid yeah, and shiny. Yeah, you had to squish it around a whole bunch. Uh, and it didn't dry yeah. out. It was more like clay. Yeah, more like clay. And yeah, it could uh, it could do image transfers with ink and stuff. And then it ruined the silly putty, and then you'd be sad. It did. You'd get dirty yeah. silly putty, and nobody wanted dirty silly putty, which was the name of my band. <laughs> Yeah, in high school, I had a band called Dirty Silly Pump Putty. Uh, I was in that with Zit and Snake and JJ. You're just describing Degrassi no. Junior High. Don't try that. Oh, shit. Not again. It's so hard to tell my life from Degrassi because my life was so much like Degrassi, I often felt. Sometimes I wonder if my memories are real or if they just came from Degrassi. One of the surefire ways to tell if your memory is real or not is if you can see yourself in the memory that you have. None of your memories should be from third person. So if you have a memory where you actually see yourself in the scene, that is a reconstruction oh. that your brain has given you of a memory that is not accurate necessarily, not 100% accurate. Wow, that's cool. And there's a lot of that shit that you think about, isn't there? Yes, because now I'm going to like lie in bed tonight and be like, is this real? <laughs> None of it's oh real. God. I mean, and then you get to the fact that everything, like we're very likely living in a simulation. Somebody's playing Sims with us. Not well, I might oh. add. Could you get me on the treadmill a little more? Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Oh my god. That's okay. I like that. That's really cool. I never thought about it like that. All right, let's That's get good. back to Calvin and Hobbes, which is like a dream to me. Yeah. So Calvin and Hobbes follows this uh like six year old boy named Calvin and his stuffed tiger who when no it's kind of like a Toy Story situation, maybe, where Hobbes comes to life. Maybe. I was gonna say save it for the end, but let's do it now. Yeah. What is your take on Hobbes? Is does Hobbes <sighs> come to life or is this imagination? It's imagination, I think. It's he comes to life. You think so? Why do you think that? I think that because this story is from the point of view of the Mm six-year-old Calvin, the protagonist, then Cobb's coming to life is real to Calvin. And as a reader, it's real to us because that's the universe we're inhabiting. Mm. So Hobbes comes to life. Hobbes comes to life. Absolutely is alive and comes to life. 
is always alive. It's for me, I, I, I see like the, it's like Santa Claus. I'm sorry, Ben. Santa's not real. Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. Um, that I wish Hobbs came to life. And I love the joy that their relationship brings. And it makes me sad in some ways because it's like that loss of innocence that now I see it from sure. the mom and dad's perspective versus when I was growing up, I saw it from Calvin's perspective. So were I to be mm. my younger self? You've gotten too yeah, old. I've, you, don't hear the, you don't hear the bells jingle anymore. I don't hear the bells jingle anymore. The and that, Polar I think Express that's what makes is me not sad. coming to pick you up. Oh. No, it's driving right on past. See, I think of it from a purely literary sort of standpoint, which is that if we are going to inhabit the universe of our protagonists, then we have to accept the world as he sees it. And like, even as adults, we need to live in a world where Hobbes is real, if you're going to engage with that strip. Yeah. And that was easy as hell to do when I, I mean, it's still easy for me now. Hobbes is just alive. And again, that's just my opinion on it. It's okay that you don't feel that way. I just want to express that Hobbes is alive to me. Always has been. Always will be. There's like a, a statement that we found on Wikipedia that I thought was actually kind of poignant. And it says that Hobbes's dual nature is a defining motif of the strip. To Calvin, Hobbes is a living anthropomorphic tiger, while all other characters see Hobbes as an inanimate stuffed toy. Though the series does not frequently mention the specific political figures or contemporary events, it explores the broad issues through uh, like environmentalism and other things through the relationship that Calvin has with this either alive or inanimate tiger. I thought like, it's a really interesting thing that one way or another, he's working through these really, really complex topics mm -hmm. in a very childlike and gentle way. Sure. It's throwing it into, it's using the real or not real as the catalyst for discussing these different events and how we view them. And to that point, what I'm saying about inhabiting the universe, uh, I am disregarding the entire universe of every other character in that case then, because they mm -hmm. are also in the strip and we do see their point of view. Yeah. So I guess he's Schrodinger's hob. He's both alive and dead. Yeah, he is. He is. He actually he is. He is both of those things. Yeah. Well, there's... <laughs> he's, well, and maybe not Schrodinger because we're observing him and he is still both. So that is actually the state of Hobbes' existence is as both of those objects. Do you think Hobbes thinks that he's alive? I mean, if Hobbes thinks, then Hobbes has to think that he's alive. You know, he thinks, therefore, think he therefore is. I think, therefore, I yeah, am. Exactly. Yeah. So Hobbes is alive based on that. Um, I'd have to go and look, but do we ever get a thought bubble from Hobbes? Because that would suggest that Hobbes is alive. Oh, that's an interesting... Yeah, we should go back and look through yeah. all the different iterations um, of the comic to see. Because Calvin wouldn't get his thoughts. And if we're getting his thoughts, then we as the reader are experiencing Hobbes' life. Yeah. Which I'd argue we were already doing even without seeing his inner thoughts, but... Well, I don't think there was ever a comic where we're first introduced to Hobbes. Like, we're just... It, we kind of join the characters... In media res. Midway through life. Like, it's not like we're there... Yeah, like, there's no Calvin meets Hobbes for the first time. It's not like there's an introduction scene. They just... We join them midway through everything. Would you want that? Would you want to see how they met? Because I don't think that matters or is necessary in any way. I don't know. I don't think it matters. It doesn't really help the story because the whole point of the story is this young child working through all these things in very fantastical ways. But uh, anyway, so um, maybe let's talk about some of the characters outside of Calvin and, and Hobbes. Who are, who are some of the other characters? Uh, yeah, we've given enough of an explainer. If you don't know what Calvin and Hobbes is yeah, at this on. point, uh, just Google it or something. But yeah, it's it's a boy and his stuffed tiger, and they go on adventures and deal with plots and situations that are both way beyond their mm -hmm. age and and exactly appropriate for their age uh, in such a beautiful sort of juxtaposition. So who do you want to talk about first? Uh, the parents, probably, because they're probably the most important characters outside of Hobbes. Um, I, I may be wrong. They're never given names, are they? No, I don't think so. It's just always mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I remember reading once the juxtaposition of uh, Calvin's parents versus the the adults that we get in a uh, strip like Peanuts, which was a huge mm -hmm. inspiration for Bill Watterson. Uh, in that, in Peanuts, they're nameless, uh, voiceless, sort of faceless figures, and in Calvin and Hobbes, they very much exist and react yeah. to the situations and. Uh, <laughs> 
are integral to the the plots and the humor that exists there. Yeah, and and they have their own. I, I really like that the parents kind of have their own strips sometimes outside of Califan. Oh, sure, I love that too. I love that we get those yeah. kind of side uh, stories with with some of these other people. Hmm. Uh, specifically the parents like that one strip where you find out that Calvin's dad is a cyclist and that becomes sort of one of his ongoing sort of like character traits is that he hates he hates bikers and yeah those were always great to me I really loved seeing that Uh, he's not a particularly friendly dad I don't mean that in a yeah yeah, I'm trying to choose my words carefully but he comes across as kind of uh well quick to anger in a lot of ways he he kind of is like he's not these kind of storybook parents that are super, super loving and and over-the-top affectionate, but they are in their own way. They seem mm-hmm. like real parents that are that love their kid very, very much, but are absolutely fucking frustrated by them sometimes because they wake up in the middle of the night and scare you to shit, waking you up to ask you like ridiculous existential questions mm-hmm. where you're like, I need to get up for work, go to bed. Mm-hmm. But then in the morning they give you like a kiss and peanut butter crackers and are so thoughtful. And so that's why I love the parents is they are so real. This is my life. Yeah. No, there's a juxtaposition of these things like being screamed at because a (laughs) marker didn't make the line the way they want. And you want them to, they want you to erase it. And you've explained to them a million times that markers can't be erased. And you're like, why, why is this still a thing? And they're screaming and throwing things all over the floor. And then when they're done, you've got a hug and a cuddle. And they're like, I really love you, dad. You're like, Oh God, I love you too. Yeah. Um, there's a great example of this in Calvin and Hobbes. I don't know if you remember this strip, but it's the one uh, where Calvin breaks his dad's binoculars yes. and his dad kind of loses at him. But the f- kind of button on that story is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, his dad sits down with him, apologizes, reminds Calvin that these are just an object and that yeah. he's more important than that. And that, that is, that's yeah. when you see who his, who his dad really is. The story for me, like the little, uh, comic cycle that I really liked was the story of um, Calvin when he and Hobbes find the baby raccoon. Oh, no. And bring it home. Oh, uh, tears. And so, so sad. So, again, spoiler alert, a lot of these things. Spoilers! They find this baby raccoon that's not doing the well. The comic's been over for... for <laughs> since 95. You guys are fine. Uh, you got like 30 <laughs> years here. So, yeah. You're no, okay. No spoil- We're going to talk about the plot of a yeah, 30-year-old comic <laughs> You're gonna here. You're going to be okay. But the, they, they do everything possible to save this little raccoon. They give it food. They give it water, a warm place to sleep. And then it passes away anyway. And... Uh, parents sitting down with Calvin and talking about how like they did everything they could and made sure that he was safe and warm when he passed. And that was a huge life lesson. And I remember reading that and thinking like, oh my God. And I I never did, but I talked to my dad about it. And I remember saying like, this is sad. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, it's sad when things die. Yeah. That moment where you have to confront mortality in a real way i definitely found animals on occasion we tried to save birds that had hit windows and stuff like that we didn't have a lot of that or maybe my parents just took it away i don't know they just didn't let you deal with that at that point yeah but that was the thing about the strip they covered a lot of um scary life events like in one of the um comics their house is broken into after they go away for mm-hmm. a wedding I remember it. They're working through the process of the parents being scared. And I remember thinking, like, do parents get scared? And my mom was like, yeah. Yeah. I need to reread that because that hits home, like, in a whole different way now. I have two kids and I live in a house for the first time in my life. Uh, Well, since being, you know, a kid myself. I've been in an apartment since then and then coming into a house and suddenly there's these things that you have to worry about and people you're supposed to care for and, and keep safe and you can't. There's so many mm-hmm. things you just can't do, even though it feels like such an imperative and obligation for you to perform that function. Yeah. If somebody wants to break into our house, they're going to, and I cannot stop that from happening. Yeah. And how do you protect and prevent things from happening to your kids when you're, you know, that there's just some things that are going to happen no matter what? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's difficult to think about. Mm-hmm. But th- this comic did it in such a, very approachable and kind way. I would say it came at it in such a realistic way, mm-hmm. um, for, which is interesting to say for a comic that, you know, is known for flights of fancy and, and the, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the wandering mind of a child. But like, yeah. 
it was real. That was a real thing to deal with. So some of the other characters that were pretty interesting. So there's the next door neighbor or neighborhood girl, Susie Durkins, which I always felt like I couldn't tell if I liked Susie because sometimes I associated with her, but a lot of the times I didn't like her. But I think that was the point mm. is because Calvin was conflicted about whether or not he liked her or didn't like her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She is set up to be a much more practical and realistic kid in a way that Calvin mm-hmm. isn't. She's the yin to his yang. I guess so. And you get some of the more interesting fancy uh, comic strips where he yeah. makes believe is being married to her. <laughs> yes. And you get those like Rex Morgan style strips oh, that are so dramatic and just yeah, really show. Serious. Like from an artistic standpoint, Bill Watterson's like wild range oh. and skill. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So Susie, I mean, she is definitely essential to the magic of Calvin mm-hmm. and Hobbes. Um, let's keep rolling with who yeah. these characters are. I want to chat about all of them. Who's next on our... Uh, then we have the babysitter, Rosalind. Mm-hmm. Rosaline. Yeah. I'm going to go Rosalind. <laughs> Rosalind. I think it's Rosalind. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I loved it. So Rosalind was the, oh, oh my gosh, just abused and used babysitter who would show up and he would lock her out of the house and be horrible to her and call her like a Nazi, which I feel like you couldn't probably do these days, but <laughs> put that stuff in a strip. Yeah. And she kept coming back, but I think the parents knew that like, we've got something going here. If you show up, we will pay you anything. Yeah, yeah. They just and threw money I at thought her. she was hilarious. And she was also sort of like, take no, no shit too from Calvin. Yeah. And a lot of like, when she got her turn to throw down on Calvin, she got him pretty good. Yeah. She absolutely did. Um, yeah. Should we move on to Mo? Yeah, let's talk about Mo. Mo is the a you know the typical bully, the archetype, the giant forehead, the moose mason sto- uh, sort. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Him don't think much, but hit hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate a a stupid strong person. Uh, I feel like if somebody was writing me, I might end up in that sort of archetype. No, you wouldn't. I have a pretty big forehead. Uh, I'm not super bright and I can hit things hard. It's fine. He, I, I, there's times where I was like, why is this character here? But looking back, you, someone had to just mindly keep Calvin in check or to give him a reason to be upset and sad sometimes. And so he really played a good foil. I mean, that's almost every character was I mean, there for yeah, that in some capacity. Some capacity yeah. He, in a lot of ways, is like Charlie Brown, yeah. but like with the ability to like fantasize and go off into his own world to keep himself yeah. happy. Because <laughs> he doesn't have any real friends. You don't see him with friends at school or anything or playing with anyone other than no. Hobbs. Well, there's one um, theme where he try- he joins baseball. Yes, And all the other kids are so upset with him because he's not in it for the game. He's fantasizing about these wild stories. I think in one of them, he becomes a character that we'll talk about in a bit. Mm -hmm. But they're just so not on the same level with him. And I think that that's why a lot of us really associate with him is because when I was growing up, and we've talked about this before, that like, I didn't have many friends. And so to watch this character who also didn't have any friends, I was like, okay, not just me. And try to engage with a group and like yeah. be like, why can't I fit in here? Yeah. Like Absolutely. I'd rather go draw pictures of tigers, which is literally something I would do. I'd sit on the playground and draw pictures of tigers in my notebook instead of playing. I mean, one of the only times I can think of making friends was actually in school in grade four or five. And it was because me and this other kid we realized that we were both drawing our like OCs. We didn't have yeah. that term at the time, but our OCs of Calvin characters, like Spaceman Spiff and like, what's his name? Uh, Captain, uh, the, the Superman knockoff character, Stupendous oh. Man or something. Yeah, Stupendous Man. Yeah, and we were just like drawing our own versions of these characters and giving them their own colors and powers and stuff. And that's like, we b- formed like a little friendship over like watching each other draw yeah. these characters. Uh but yeah, I never, I like, I tried very many times to like fit in and socialize and it very rarely worked uh, the way it's supposed to for mm-hmm. other people that I, I've seen in, in stories and media. Mrs. Wormwood, since oh, we're in school. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, like, I can see Miss Wormwood in my day-to-day life. No, it's like this yeah. teacher who's like, She's been doing it like a long time. She's just so sick of this shit. And on the one level, one more year to retire. Yeah, where I'm like, I get that you're like this kid, but I think that Calvin is the definition of what like 
a modern day learner is. I actually wrote a paper on Calvin, the the child Cal- character Calvin, um, in my a master's degree paper because I was talking about how this is a child who has this untapped brilliance who, because a teacher's apathy, goes completely ignored mm-hmm. and wouldn't necessarily hate school if it was delivered in a certain way. And so there are some kids out there who really thrive in the sit in your seat, do your work type environment, and that's fine for them. But there's this whole other universe of children that need to run around and experience learning in a different way, and that doesn't make them dumb. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was the frustrating thing about maybe when we were growing up, I hope it's a little bit better now, Mm -hmm. that just because you don't fit in doesn't mean you're stupid. And yeah. I felt like Calvin was branded as like this dumb, bad kid. And he wasn't. Definitely saw myself in Calvin with my inability to pay attention or engage with like people just talking at me. Yeah. It wasn't until college that I realized that like part of the reason I would doodle all the time was because I could actually hear and focus my like listening better when I was doodling and had something for my hands to do. Mm-hmm. But like nobody ever helped me figure that out. No. No, of course not, because they're... Mrs. Wormwood, or sorry, Ms. Wormwood Ms. is Wormwood. named for uh, the Apprentice Demon from the Screwtape Letters <laughs> by C.S. Lewis. Uh, I recall yes. there being a strip or two with some redemption for, for uh, Miss Wormwood, but I can't, I can't quote one at this point. I can't think of anything specifically that made me be like, oh, she's not that bad, because she was constantly... Mm-hmm. Like yelling at him or being like, she oh, never engaged with Calvin no, in a way that, not like, in a that's just not how way. education was looked at at that point. It's, it's honestly, that's even how Calvin's parents are. The parenting isn't looked at in that way anymore either. Yeah. Like that, those are not models for parenting or education anymore. Uh, here's a great quote from Watterson, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrote this one down when I was doing my like setup for this episode. Miss Wormwood believes in the value of education. So, needless to say, she's an unhappy person. <laughs> Uh, yeah yeah yeah. does that hit home that hits home yeah but i read something uh, and i wish i could think back to where i found it but it was a quote saying that um a a terrible teacher is worse than a drug dealer in a community and i really believe in that this is a tangent but i had some terrible teachers (laughs) I remember one who told us to go play in traffic and just like screamed at us all the time. Another one who like, if you'd ask a question, she'd get mad at you and just tell you to like reread something. Yeah. Uh, Another one who I thought was fun at the time. And then when I got older, realized he was like sexually harassing female students in our class. Oh, that's Yeah, not in like a, like I'm trying to hit on you way, but just in a wildly inappropriate way to talk to, to yeah. females, like talking about like stapling their tits to their desks if they couldn't sit down and shit Ugh. like that. And I was just like... That's horrifying. Yeah. Uh, God. If um, Do you think the quality of teaching would uh, increase if we compensated teachers better? Um, what, what is it? What's the key to getting I, better I, education? I think it's reducing the demands on teachers so smaller classrooms less of a not necessarily smaller smaller classrooms but like i think sometimes people use teachers as the third parent or as the nanny or oh, absolutely public school i mean for private education and i think people need to realize that like teaching and education it's not child care it's not parenting and you need to raise your kids. So you, that means that there's an expectation. But that's absolutely what it's set up as. It is. Yeah. But that's the issue is that like, yeah. I can't, I, I once, I, okay, I can't tell that story, but I can't parent your child. I am there to teach them, but that means you have to do some shit at home and on the weekends. Like that's just the short of it. It's so fucking wild too, because then the thing that you always see like the parents up in arms about is like rallying that all these, these teachers think that they can you know, be the parents Mm -hmm. to our kids. Like how dare they decide what our kids learn and blah, blah, blah. We're the parents. We get to decide that stuff. How is that? How does that even square away with this idea that like parents aren't even willing to like raise their children in some situations or some circumstances? It feels completely at odds. It it just shows that. But maybe it's not. Maybe that just shows that they're not dealing with that. So they lash out against people that are doing any sort of minimal educating. I don't, like it's just it's so so complex but I, I feel that there's 
a lot of demand on teachers to to parent. There's also when things get cut from education, it's it's a ripple effect. So if um, it's not just the cutting of education, but it's the cutting of organizations and partners to education. So there's mm. no more public health nurses in schools that I'm aware of that aren't mm-hmm. like there are, but the school has to pay for them. Whereas before that was just something that was provided. So when you cut other organizations that work in partnerships with public education, your your the problem doesn't go away. It still exists, but now there's nobody to care for it. So now the teacher, because they're this ner- like this person who cares, becomes the social worker, the nurse, the psychologist, the, like all of the things. And I think if teachers weren't expected to wear so many hats, you would get healthier, happier people who could do their f-ing job without worrying about mm-hmm. everything. But I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent, but it sounds very similar to the way people are describing sort of how police have been set up at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Which is like we've yeah. asked them to put on so many hats for so long, or they've asked to put them on, who knows. But uh, yeah. you know, now they're doing all these things that they're not trained for and aren't their jobs. And um, I guess we're all shocked Pikachu face <laughs> that they, the outcomes aren't the way we want them to be. <laughs> Like, what do you mean you can't be all of the things I need in this very moment and do be exactly yeah. the kind of person I want? Like, no. Well, I mean, and I'm not putting it all on like society or just squarely yeah. on, on, on public servants. But yeah, in some cases, I would say that like departments are looking for more funding for certain individuals in those systems, not necessarily the frontline workers. And to get that, they take on more jobs and, and force the lower end, not lower end, I don't know what the right term is, but the people not in the executive positions to take on more so they can yeah. justify asking for more finances and, and keeping those in salaries. Yeah. I don't know though. Just sounds very oh, familiar. It's, it's in so many different lines of work. It's not unique to teaching or education. It's, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's many things. But it seems, seems very familiar to like public service. Yeah. We keep asking people to do more with less. And and then suddenly when you say it that way, it's not just public service. It's, yeah. it's uh you know, every corporate situation ever because you know i've worked many jobs where suddenly our department of four becomes a department of two and then a department of one and oh we're going to hire more people but i ended you know i end up doing the whole (laughs) job for as long as i can handle it and then burn out the the thing that i just just cooks my ass is when i love that term cooks your ass cooks my ass puts my ass on a cast iron pan (laughs) and put some oil on it and just turns the heat up to high it up serve with toast uh, Gluten free um, is when people are like, if you don't like it, then quit. Like, no, that's not the fucking answer. Is to say like, ah, uh, yes, it's the wonderful answer of, oh, you don't like capitalism? Well, then, then don't leave. participate like, in uh, the te- capitalist society. Got you. It's it's not an all or nothing. It's you want to end climate change? Well, you took a car here, didn't you? <laughs> what do you? How the fuck else am I supposed to get around? You per- yeah. you don't like society, but you participate in society. <laughs> Yes, we are inside of the systems and we want to make them but better. But I think you see that in Calvin and Hobbes, That doesn't though. mean that we can magically stop participating. Oh, absolutely. Right? You see that, especially with Calvin's dad freaking out about cars and talking about, like, there's moments where he talks about how much he hates his job. Mm-hmm. But he's still, he had, like... We still have to do the things that we hate sometimes. Uh, patent attorney, if I recall correctly. Yeah, that sounds right. I'm trying to, or patent something. Patent clerk, yeah. Anyway, so we yeah. do digress. But anyway, that's that's how I feel about Miss Wormwood. <laughs> well, let's take a little break now that we've covered the kind of main side characters yeah. here. Let's go to Who's That Pokemon? Who's that Pokemon? Pokemon? Who's that Pokemon? Do you have one? I've got you one. Do you got I don't one? have one. Yeah. Okay, I've got one. I'm just going to re-familiarize myself for a second and get Ooh, prepared very exciting. Um, to give you this really great one. All right, so the silhouette is sort of an oval okay. uh, with another oval on top and another semicircle sort of oval on top and then sort of a protruding hot dog shape off of the other end of the oval. Okay. And then attached to that is another oval. Okay. Uh, and then... A couple of sticks that go down to some other sticks. It's a mutant snowman. Oh, that's a great guess, but no. Mm, no. Okay. Good guess, though. Really great guess. Is it from the, the Calvin and Hobbes universe? In a roundabout way, yes. Oh, this is interesting. Okay. It isn't, but it is also intrinsically Calvin and Hobbes. Is it Spaceman's best spaceship? It isn't. Um, ah. So what I'm describing is not something that has ever featured in Calvin and Hobbes, 
but is also uh, Calvin and Hobbes wouldn't exist without it. Calvin and is it Charlie Brown? Oh, that's a good guess too. And you're in the right vein, but not Charlie Brown. <sighs> the other most influential sort of strip to uh, Bill Waters. Astro Boy? No, I didn't. I don't think he knew about Did Astro Boy at all. Astro? I don't think I know what it is. I give up. It's uh, it's Ignat's Mouse from Crazy oh. Cat. Oh. Um, which was a huge inspiration on why uh, I, I remember reading about sort of Bill Watterson's uh, interest in drawing backgrounds and really mm-hmm. like sort of loopy, interesting stuff in the backgrounds came from from Crazy Cat. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll I'll link to something in the show notes that explains that better than I just did. But yeah, it's Ignat's Mouse. Also, the mouse that inspired the Ignatz Awards, which are a cartooning comic strip award. I was going to say the Ignatzies, and I was like, ooh, no, that doesn't sound good. No, don't. not the Ignatzies. They don't call it that. <laughs> they should not. Don't change the name. Uh, <laughs> They're not don't. going to. <laughs> good, because they shouldn't. Uh, okay. What's up next on our itinerary? Um, Maybe let's talk about the best alter egos that Calvin has. All right, let's do it. Because there's really, I, I can only think of three that are consistent, but there's a couple minor subplots where he becomes, for example, he goes into the tra- uh, transmogrifier, which is a cardboard mm-hmm. box. Scientific progress goes boink. Love it. Uh, where he becomes a small tiger. Yes, a Hobbes adjacent tiger. And walks around following Hobbes. Oh, when he has the duplicator, when he just becomes multiples of himself, mm-hmm. all the clones. Uh, yeah. Oh, what else have we got? And they use that as an explanation for like how kids can be <laughs> annoying when they just repetitively <laughs> ask things one. over and over again. It wasn't Calvin. It was all his clones. Or why a kid can be so wonderful in one moment and then forget something and be a complete dink in like two seconds later. Absolutely. Uh, then we have Spaceman Spiff. Who is just kind of like a, I don't know what you, like, He's Flash like a Flash Gordon esque yeah. type character going on adventures, running around mm-hmm. in space. Ex- yeah, experiencing the universe. Then there is the Captain Stupendous, Stupendous Man, Stupendous Man. Thank you. I yeah. don't know why I did that. No, but then there's you. also, and I can't remember, and see, maybe you know the. He plays a detective. Uh, Tracer Bullet. Yes, thank you, Tracer Bullet. Yes, these are some of my favorite strips are his like hard-boiled detective Dick Tracy style stuff. And he's like this, he's still a six-year-old, but he's like smoking a cigarette and drinking like whiskey. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, I love it. Talking about his mom as a dame. <laughs> and he shoots her with a dart gun. <laughs> yeah, I remember oh, that's that. such a good and, like, line. Tries to solve the case of who broke the like lamp or something. But, but it, it was, was him. always him. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, all his characters are great. Uh, the stuff that I always really squared with myself as a kid, and like I think to an extent I still act this way, is the stuff where he just pretends to be like a dinosaur or a uh, monster and stomps around. That's and a I good have very one. Very vivid yeah. memories of taking that on very strongly and doing that stuff. That I never even thought of that, but you're right. I really like when he would pretend to be like the dinosaur. <laughs> It's just such a little kid thing to do. And just like screaming at his parents with like a dinosaur noise. Yeah. yeah it's it's amazing. That's yeah, okay, that's that's good. I like, like that. It's just it just plays to that inner narrative that's happening. We're like, okay, example, this morning we're sitting around and our oldest son is doing something and just out of nowhere he just screams at the top of the lungs, My feet are small and skinny. And like we just burst out <laughs> laughing. And it's like like that's very Calvin and Hobbes. Like apparently something else was going on there. Like before he made that observation, or he might have just made the observation. Yeah. But I could see like an inner universe where like he had gone on some sort of weird adventure, and like yeah. I don't know, a machine shrunk his feet down. He's like, ah, oh, no. But he's always coming up with characters and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, uh, the helpful hermit crab, which is like one of my favorite characters that pops up. Uh, it's the one that cleans up the most and helps the most. That's amazing. Oh, what are some of the other characters he has? Uh, not Baby Butterworth. What's it called? <laughs> Lots of characters. They're great. I love them. Aww. We write them down. That's great. Oh, I really like yeah. that. Candy King Joe from Christmas when he'd wear like just random Christmas shit and walk oh. around with a candy cane. 
when my nephew was a baby, he like when he'd be getting ready for bed, he, like I'm sure this is like all kids, but you'd be changing his diaper for his nighttime diaper. I'm sorry, he's like a teenager now. Sorry, buddy. Um, and oh, well, as long as you're not still changing his diaper for a nighttime. No, diaper. He, this was when he was a baby, and you'd be putting him in his nighttime diaper. But first, you had to catch him because he'd be like, ha, 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 and oh, he'd God. run off. And we would call him Peter Pantsless. <laughs> and we'd be like, uh oh, Peter Pantsless. And then he'd like run around the house, like laughing madly because he'd have his like porky pig in it where he's got the, the shirt on the top and <laughs> yeah, like the shirt and nothing, nothing on. <laughs> and it was so cute. His little, his little kid dick was hanging out. <laughs> It's just running so around with that, with that little penis waggling oh, around. Oh, I don't like to think about uh, that. Kids yeah. do this. It's so weird. Yeah. I mean, that's just what they do. It's funny. Yeah. I mean, being naked is hilarious. So what? I came in to check on my son one morning because he was like yelling for dad, dad. And it was like a little bit later than he usually sleeps. And so like yeah. got up, went to go see him. And he's like, can you find me? And I see a lump on his bed. So I pull back the blanket and he's there under his blankets, just completely naked. And he yells at me. He's like, I'm a tortoise. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I wanted to get up. So I took off my pajamas. I was like, Like, yeah, that makes sense. I was like, but why didn't you finish getting dressed? He's like, that's your job. (laughs) You get me dressed. Get going. So I just played around naked, (laughs) pretending to be a tortoise in my bed until you showed up. Oh my God, that is. But that's such a Calvin thing to do. Because it makes perfect sense when you're like, I mean, yeah, I guess you're right. (laughs) The logic is is there if you work in that universe. If you play in their world, the suspension of disbelief. Is there. Absolutely. Oh, I like that. That's good. Where were mm-hmm. we? Let's keep going. We were talking about his characters, his alter yeah. Did we hit them all? I think we kind of hit the big we ones. Did. Yeah, yeah. So those were all the different ones. I think I think my favorite is Spaceman Spiff. I got to go with Spaceman. You know, I was like off the cuff, Spaceman Spiff is the one I remember yeah. the most. And I love those adventures he'd go on. Um, yeah, just like the the scenery that he'd go to. But yeah. I think my favorite I'm going to go with, I, I sort of alluded to already, is is either like the random monsters or or dinosaurs that he would be. Cause I think those are the ones that have informed who I am as a person. The most I'm absolutely the kind of person who still wants to just bend the dinosaur roar and stomp around for fun. Absolutely. Love it. <laughs> uh, what was our next question to dig into here? Maybe the best uh, story arc. And so we, we cut, like we've mentioned a couple so far, but any yeah. other ones that you think are really like pivotal or need to be talked about? Hmm. I'm unsure, but those, I feel like I might've, I might've shot my shot with those ones mm-hmm. early by accident. Um, cloning is good. I love mm-hmm. the scientific progress goes boink. I like everything to do with the snowman. The raccoon yes. is a heartbreaker. Yeah. Um, what else do we have? He loses, he loses Hobbs at one point. Oh, yeah. And that is a devastating, well, devastating storyline. In one of the books um, where Bill Watterson writes memoirs of different uh, comics, like how he came up with them or uh, community responses. He said that one specifically, people were writing in concerned about Hobbes. And so that really goes to show you that people were like, oh my God, is this how he ends it? Mm. And how much they cared. And I thought that was really sweet. Oh, wild. Uh, is yeah. that one of your favorites then? Is there any other big storylines you, you want to mention? I absolutely loved the Snow Goons when they start crafting each other and he wakes up in the middle of the night and they've created more and more. And there's an army of disgusting snowmen. God, I wanted to make snowmen like oh, that my yes. entire life. And it just never seemed to work out. I could never get them quite right. I loved it. And now I could yeah. make that happen and I don't. I don't know if we just don't have the snow for it anymore. I th- you, need, you need space and time. And I always thought mm-hmm. that Calvin's house looked really cool because it, it looked like it was – backed on to like a ravine and just fields and hills mm-hmm. that he could go uh, ride his red cart on. Um, and so I really like that storyline of anything where he's outside. I really liked, and there's one. Um, so I don't remember what they're called, but he had the strips, but then on Sundays when there was color in the newspapers, He'd get like a half page strip and it was big. Those are often when he do like the adventure really? stuff, yeah. or like fantasy stuff with the beautiful, beautiful backgrounds. Yeah, the crazy cat inspired backgrounds mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, but like, there was one that he did where he his dad is doing work at home and Calvin and there's no words, no written word or anything. He tries to get his dad to go outside and play with him, and he says no at first. And then he looks, Calvin's dad looks through the window and sees him playing outside, and then he 
abandons his work and he goes outside and spends the whole day mm. with Calvin. I was going to say, because the thing you just said about time and space with the snow goons, especially like a lot of Calvin takes place because, or at least it might suggest that like his parents are preoccupied, not giving him yeah. the type of attention that modern parenting would suggest we should be, we should be engaging with our children with. Well, and they're constantly turning off the TV on him. There's so many strips where he'd be watching TV and his mom or his dad would come turn it off and be like, go outside. And that's mm-hmm. why I feel like maybe but they're not going outside with him. They're not going outside with him. And so those episodes, like those episodes, those strips <laughs> where he's with his parents and they're really spending time together, I always found really mm-hmm. sweet. But I, when I say that, I don't know if this comic strip would land in this day, day and age. I don't think it's because it's saying or doing anything super inappropriate. It's because I don't know how much unsupervised outside time kids really have anymore where they would relate to that it changes it's been an issue for me too is like i remember that we just hop on a bike yeah. and be back by sundown you know and like i would never let my kids do that now especially not in the neighborhood <laughs> no. i live in like yeah you know yeah it's it's an interesting like things have shifted our perspectives have mm-hmm. shifted i'd say positive in a way that's positive so like we can mourn the loss of that freedom but maybe we never really should have had that because there was a lot of stuff that happened yeah. that you know parents ended up not being aware of or just like completely like uninformed I about know. it's hard I'm to on the s- fence about that one I'm just saying there might be reasons that we've shifted away from that approach part of that is society sort mm-hmm. of fear-mongering in some ways. I'm not trying to downplay, yeah. you know. But even, like, there's so many studies that say that, like, boredom is a good thing for your brain to develop because it forces introspective uh, reflection. It forces you to be creative. And so I think the 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 ultimate of creativity in the Calvin and Hobbes universe is Calvin Ball. Mm-hmm. And so because there's never really... It's so Calvin Ball is a game that Calvin and Hobbes play. There's no rules other than... You kind of make up roles as you go. Mm-hmm. And you have to wear those masks. Yes, like the masks. Bandit masks. The consistent masks. The turtle masks, as I always thought of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the turtle bandit. Yeah, yeah, and you can just win by calling out, you know, a different, a different, uh, you know, rule as somebody else is approaching <laughs> a victory point. When I used to go to summer camp, there was a game sort of loosely inspired by this called Garbage Ball, but I don't really remember how that worked. <laughs> Uh, and I hated summer camp, so oh, well, less said about that. Good. I just something just came to me now. We are wrong about when at the beginning of the show we said there is not like an intro where Calvin meets Hobbes and like discovers him. There is. Is there? It's the first sort of storyline <gasps> where Calvin goes hunting with a tuna fish sandwich oh, to catch Hobbes. You're right. It's the very sort of intro to the entire series. He goes you hunting. Are. Yeah. And he catches a tiger. His mom asks him what he's doing. And he says he's going to go catch a tiger with a tuna fish sandwich. It's their favorite. And then it cuts to like a panel of Hobbes caught going like, we're suckers that way or something like that. Like, Oh my gosh, you're totally right. I forgot about that. How cute. Yeah. yeah. Magical. Uh, yeah, absolutely wonderful. Um, there's a something, uh, if we can, if you don't mind me jumping off of sort of our... yeah our little role here. Um, something I wanted to talk about, which was uh, Bill Watterson specifically and his work specifically mm-hmm. in prepping for this episode, I found myself reading about how he was able to negotiate two sabbaticals with his publisher, which is basically unfucking yeah. heard of in, in syndicated comics back in the eighties and nineties. Um, but his, his book was so po- uh, popular and uh, I forget who it is, but whoever his publisher or syndication group was at the time, were so desperate to keep him from burning out that they actually suggested during a, a contract negotiation that he take two sabbaticals. So he took nearly a year off wow. twice from creating comics. That's amazing. In his 10-year span of publication. Gosh. And, uh, you know, got very different feedback from other cartoonists at the time. That is interesting to me specifically, just as somebody who works or exists adjacent to somebody creating uh, not comic strips, but comics in yeah. a similar vein who you know, did something kind of unheard of in, in publishing, which is, you know, take the most popular book being sold and, and take three years off from it and just stop mm-hmm. doing it. Uh, which enabled us to have, you know, a life and a family yeah. and, and exist outside of just cranking to create out yeah. that content. Um, but yeah, in syndication comics, it was just so interesting and, and just so necessary, the idea of a sabbatical or a break from creative work in order to mm-hmm. keep going. So I guess the artist himself, that's that's one of the things that I found maybe like 
the most sad, but also the most understandable because the comic had such a big impact on so many people that a, a part of me is like, well, I want to know more about him, but him being such a private person and so committed to his life as a private mm-hmm. individual, I respect and relate to that so much. And so while I would love to be mm-hmm. able to have him like be a person on Twitter where I could tweet at him, like, like we do with like fucking Paul Young Sun Lee, who's constantly like we're we're adding yeah, but I, mean, I i understand him being like i've been out of twitter for so long and i know this is a tangent but like i'm one foot out of of twitter at all times because i stopped having a personal account ages and ages ago and we only started an account for yeah this podcast to try to you know get our show out there but like I'm teetering on just axing uh, Twitter I get it. altogether. I'm not. I'm not convinced it's a particularly strong avenue for us, anyhow. So no, not, I feel like Twitter's day in the sun has kind of set. But it's definitely gone Facebook. Yeah, but but him not being an accessible celebrity mm-hmm. or public figure, there's moments where I'm like, but I want to tell him how much he means to me. It's mm-hmm. kind of like that's not his problem. Like you, <laughs> you know, like you having a very big reaction to my work is wonderful, but like, I don't care. And I don't want you to have full access to me. I get that. Critical reception in, in art is such an interesting topic and fascinating to me again. Um, especially nowadays because people feel entitled to immediate, yes, immediate contact about art that they're consuming. And I think where I am right now is that my belief is that it is great and absolutely deserves to have criticism. People deserve to react and, and explain how they feel about work. I'm not sure that necessarily they deserve an immediate response from the person that created the work. Yeah. An apology yeah. or a thank you, or, you know, in your, yeah. you know, your case, the positive or often nowadays the negative, like, mm-hmm. The work, yeah, I'm not sure the back and forth is is part of what people deserve in this process, um, yeah. the human access, you know, and, and trying to keep in mind the harm that work can create, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Do you feel like, I mean, the reason I bring this up is because it yeah. sounds like you're saying you agree that you don't feel like it's like you deserve to have that access to them for positive or for negative. It, it is my issue if I want to talk to someone, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, yeah. that's why we got this yeah, podcast. Like, we can talk about how great Bill Watterson exactly. is and Calvin and, and Hobbes. if a person chooses to respond one way or another, awesome. But like, mm-hmm. I never expect anything from anyone because honestly, I think expectations are one of the greatest downfalls yeah. of society. Expect nothing. Be happy with whatever you get. Like recently I sent, I told John this the other day and he was like, Oh, that's, did you, that's nice. Because I said, I was having this moment of reflection this week because it was a stressful week and I was trying to think of all the positives and I was thinking about how much I love Power Wash Simulator and I wrote them an email (laughs) (laughs) just saying like, um, so I wrote wrote an email to the developers of the game, um, to their little website contact form and I just wrote this email basically saying like, look, I've got a really stressful job. Things in my life can be pretty stressful but like your game has brought the business like shining beacon of you know, greatness in my life this year. And I loved it so much and blah, blah, blah. And John was like, oh, did they write you back? And I was like, I haven't even looked to see if they've responded mm-hmm. to my email because I'm so bad at responding to my own emails mm-hmm. that that's not why I sent the email. Like, I no. hope that maybe one day someone on that team will be like, oh, that's nice. And then move on with their day. Yeah. But I wrote that because I, to me, I wanted to say, put good out there. Because yeah. it meant so much to me. And if that is, if that lands, great. But I don't need to hear back from them. I always find that for me, like either positive or negative, when I feel like that desire to like write something and need to send that out, I often find myself writing, sitting, and then just deleting positive yeah. or negative and realizing like this is inconsequential to anyone but me. <laughs> I did the thing I needed to do, which was typing it. And now I it's do gone. that with Reddit constantly. I'll write out a response and be like, and eh, delete because who, who cares what I say? But it's one of the places where I'll just fucking hit enter no matter what, because I don't give a I shit. I never do because I'm like, no one cares what I think. <laughs> I know. And I'm like, I don't care if they care. So <laughs> here's something dumb and I'm just going to write it. <laughs> And I'm always the person on Reddit that's like, I love that. Or like, that's always like the Pollyanna, like, 
things are good. <laughs> like I, I and you only get downloaded really because you're not adding anything substantial no, to the just conversation. Like, and so someone says something mean or like thanks tips. Or like, well, oh, I was just trying to be polite. <laughs> Does anybody actually say thanks tips anymore? No one <laughs> has said still you thanks on Reddit tip. in 2010. That's me. On Reddit. <laughs> Teasing. <laughs> uh, yeah did you have any like really like emotional connections to anything about Calvin and Hobbes you want to share or just that like I associated so much with Calvin growing up like I was a person who didn't have friends I didn't really fit in I was alone most of the time my best friends were video games books and art so mm-hmm. it, I just saw so much of myself in Calvin and Calvin like I was late to read and Calvin and Hobbes was actually what my dad used to teach me to read. So he would That's help awesome. me like sound out the words and we talk about it. And if it wasn't for Calvin and Hobbes, I don't think I'd have the same emotional response and love that I have for comics. They were a safe thing for me and I just love them so much. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Like is it's a similar sort of like as far as the love came in, uh came from peanuts and then and then calvin and Hobbes, and even in a way garfield especially like yeah. those those long like digests that you used to oh, get yeah, I from like scholastic <laughs> i really love the way old garfield looked like the really like thick and yeah. dumpy garfield like that was my garfield like with his like constant like, like yeah beady I mean, there's nothing yeah. particularly wonderful about garfield but it was just something about reading those as a kid that was comforting for me specifically with, with Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, I had the privilege to travel to the Angolum comic festival in, in 2015, early 2015. And it was the same year uh, that Cal, uh, that Bill Watterson had sort of been selected as their like grand prize winner for the festival. And usually that correlates with that person ending up uh, like planning a lot of the programming for the upcoming uh, festival. But all of that to say I got to be there when that was he was the selection, the grand prize selection. And that meant that there was a uh, an exhibition of his work wow. at, uh, at one of the places there. And it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. I got to walk, you know, nose close to these strips that he made. And and for the first time, you know, Bill Watterson is such a confident artist and such wonderful lines. And he feels just so like... You know, you just imagine him when he puts, you know, quill to paper or pen to paper or whatever, yeah. knowing exactly what he wants to put down and not making any mistakes. But I got to go up and see these strips and they're just covered with fucking whiteout. Oh, I love it. Just all over them covered with whiteout. And it was just such like, I, don't, I wouldn't use the term religious, but there was something spiritual about seeing this art form that I engage with uh, so sincerely, yeah. especially comic strips. I think more than... Yeah more than even comic books, it's comic strips for me. Um, And just seeing that the process for this person was never easy or straightforward in the way you might imagine from someone so successful. Mm -hmm. That there was work involved there and mistakes. And that was beautiful to me. Oh, I love that. That is awesome. Um, So what are we excited for with Bill Bill Patterson, as you put in the notes? Bill Patterson. (laughs) Thank you, Autocorrect, for that. Uh, I, yeah, I'm really excited for the the upcoming graphic novel. Yeah, the absolutely ex- uh, elusive Bill Watterson is putting out some new work for the first time since Calvin and Hobbes ended, really, more or less. Like yeah. he's done uh, that that strip for Pearls Before Swine that I sent to you today. <laughs> yeah, which is hilarious. And read, I was reading excerpts of that out loud to John. It was, it was so funny. It was really well written because it was just... I can understand that kind of like fan boy, fan girl, fan person mentality of like, oh my God, it's Bill Mm -hmm. Watterson. I'm going to shit myself. But to just fall in and fluke into something like that, I was just like, oh, awesome. So really excited for the upcoming graphic novel. No matter what, I'm buying it. I'm going to read it and cry. Oh, I already pre-ordered it. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, I'm I'm interested in what you thought was worth working on. Yes. Yeah. um, And seeing where you're at. Yeah. Just nothing but good things. Um, love it. Love it, love it, love it. Final word on Calvin and Hobbes? A quote to go out on? Ooh. Um, <laughs> okay, so there is a, maybe like a little anecdote and then we could go out on that and we can post it or link to it. There is this poem that he illustrated of aliens coming to earth and sucking up all of our resource resources. I remember that one vividly. I auditioned many, 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 many years ago 
to be a member of a puppet troupe mm-hmm. in town and they wanted you to be able to perform something uh, like a monologue or something. And that was what I was going to perform had I actually gotten to the audition in person round. And I never did, but I always... Well, they're kicking themselves now. No, I mean, they made the right call. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> but I always thought it was so funny and so poignant. And I think everyone should take a look at that comic about the aliens coming from a far distant world. Yeah, we'll definitely drop that in the show notes. I guess to end on, it's it's a magical world, Lexi, old buddy. Let's yeah. go. Uh, let's go exploring. Love Until it. next time, dork, 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 dork. Thanks for listening to Dork Matters. If you like the podcast, subscribe, give us a rating, and tell your friends about us. If you are a fellow dork and have a dork issue that you think we need to discuss, tell us on our social media. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter. You can also check out original art and other content from Ben and myself. We'd like to say a big thank you to Yabra for the use of our theme song, Dance, off of their Astral EP, as well as a thank you to Jess Schmidt for producing and editing our podcast. Thanks, Jess. Dork Matters. This podcast is created on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Nations, which includes the Sigzika, the Begaini, and the Gaina. We also acknowledge the Stony Nakoda Nation, Sutena, and Métis Nation Region 3.